And I want to begin by thanking our wonderful friends at the library. The president of the Friends is here, Pam O'Connell. Thank you, Friends, for helping make this event possible. And then I also want to thank Theodore Books for being here. There are books for sale in the back. So, <clears throat> yes, happy to have them here. Um, so let me know, uh, let, let you know a little bit about uh, the, our, our uh, guest today. Mark Chusano is the author of the George Santos biography, The Fabulist, which we're going to be discussing tonight. As I mentioned, they're available in the back. Mark has also written a story collection, Marine Park, uh, which received a Penn Hemingway Award honorable mention in 2015. He's covered two presidential elections and many local ones as a columnist and editorial writer for Newsday. And his writing has appeared in places like the New York Times, New York Magazine, Politico, the Paris Review, and McSweeney's. He teaches at uh, CUNY City Tech. And we are very happy to have the opportunity tonight to speak with Mark about his new book, The Fabulist, as well as what his experience has been like covering George Santos and politics over the last several years. So I think you're in for a treat. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Mark Chisano. Uh, any talent there. Sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I highly recommend coming to check out Tanisha Mitchell. She's a, she's a treat. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Mark, for being here. Of course. Uh, so as I'm sure, you know, we are here in Port Washington. We're in the third congressional district. Um, we have, uh, I was telling Mark that we've really had a, a front seat uh, to the fabulous uh, here in Port Washington. We've really been watching the story uh, continue to play out in real time. Um, and I, I was explaining to Mark, we had early voting uh, for the special election over 10 days here in the Port Washington Library. Um, so I think for many of us, we're quite familiar with the, the headlines of this story. Um, so what I'd like to do is really talk to you tonight about parts of George Santos' story that are not as well known. Um, and talk a little bit about your take on politics here in the 3rd Congressional District uh, and on Long Island, uh, as well as what the story tells us about larger issues in terms of politics in America today and the state of journalism today. So I'd like to focus our talk a little bit in that, that direction. Great. Yeah. You know, it's funny, I was just thinking the, the idea that, of course, all the people here know a lot about George Santos. I bet you know almost as much as I do. Um, one of the fun parts about working on this book was coming across people who weren't even in politics. They were just, you know, sort of either residents of the third congressional uh, district or just kind of New York who just knew everything about Santos. It was like, you know, they, they knew where he was born, they knew his birthday, they knew like every single gaffe that he'd done, all the lies. And so it was really fun to kind of engage with this Santos community, um, which I'm sure you got, many of you are, are members of, yeah. for better or worse. <laughs> right. Um, so I'd like to start with a quote. This is a review um, in, that was appeared in The Advocate. An essential read for those seeking to understand the complex tapestry of truth and fabrication that defines the American political landscape in the age of George Santos. Giussano's work goes beyond the spectacle of Santos' alleged misdeeds and his insights into Santos' psyche and the implications of his actions extend beyond mere political critique. So I enjoyed this review uh, in part in that, um, you know, I think it suggests that you were able to provide insights into George Santos that, that humanized him beyond the cartoonish figure that we, we've to know. Um, can, can you just give us some of that deeper background in terms of his early life, his relationship with his mom, yeah. uh, you know, other things that may have helped form him yeah, into I who he is? One, one thing that sort of has surprised some people who've been reading the book and reviewing it has, has been that I, I did try to humanize him, or, or not even human, we're all human, right, but did try to um, present a full picture and not make this just a joke, not make him a cartoon, um, because I think he is a complicated figure, right? Yeah. He, he has a lot of demons, um, also has a lot of charisma and a lot of talent, and could have been any, you know, one of many things, right, in his life. And the fact that he chose this and sort of created this tragedy, I think, is interesting and sad and worth our attention. Um, and so, you know, it, it wasn't that hard to present what might be seen as like a balanced portrayal of him because he had such an interesting upbringing. Um, you know, he's born in Queens in this hospital that's a kind of um, 
you know, it's been described in newspapers as a safety net hospital. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's a place that, you know, is not like the best sort of most, uh, you know, the fanciest hospital in the world. Um, by the way, he lies about his birth there, um, but we can get into that later maybe, <laughs> um, about the exact weeks uh, that he was born. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just an example of the fact that he'll lie about anything in this kind of strange way. But he, um, he's born in Jackson Heights, and he goes to this uh, truly, you know, um, basement, one bedroom apartment that he's talked about, the rats that live there and how kind of uh, not super great uh, of a situation it was. Um, but what was interesting to me from the beginning was talking to, for example, I talked to some teachers of his um, in his you know, middle school who said that he always had this ambition, this drive, this kind of um, you know, wanting to be more than he was which I think we see the result of that now, mm -hmm. um, but it was there from the beginning, wanting to kind of change himself and be, be someone different. Um, and you know, a lot has been talked about his mother, Fatima, um, who uh, he created all these stories about, all these lies, right? Famously, you know, the 9-11 one, uh, the fact that she was, uh, or the lie that she was a Wall Street executive. Um, and so we kind of know the jokes and the lies, but what was interesting to me was what really happened, and I, you know, I, I got the her, her immigration paperwork, which is like I can't remember the exact numbers, over 100 pages of um, documents about her, you know, interactions with federal immigration officials over the years that she was in the country, mm. and so that shows you the real picture of her, right, right. as presented right. by these documents, and it's totally different, right, and not. And neither good nor bad, but really interesting and really complex. I mean, mm -hmm. she comes across the border um, and you know doesn't have documentation. Is appears never to have become a citizen of the U.S., um, which is an irony given his mm -hmm. perspective on citizenship right. um, later on. Um, and her first job here, one of her first jobs, is working this incredibly backbreaking job in the fields in Florida, picking beets. And I actually talked to the farmer, um, the farmer's son, who uh, who she worked for. Um, he described the labor to me, and it's you know heartbreaking. You know the amount of work that these people are doing and the pay that they're getting, which is nothing. Um, and so then, like many people before her, she comes to New York, searching op for opportunity, and has difficult jobs there too. She's cleaning houses, and again, Santos is lying about this. He you know isn't uh, she, he's not admitting that this is her reality. But what's so funny to me, this is just this little detail that almost is meaningless in the grand scheme of things politically, but to me it just is so telling about Santos and about America. Um, his mother ends up working for the family um, of the, for the family that created Marvel, Marvel Comics, oh, right. um, which is just such a strange coincidence that you have this you know fabulous, this like incredible storyteller, you know politically. Um, intersecting with this other great American storytelling enterprise, you know, and both of these kind of legends and, uh, you know, the way that we kind of think of ourselves as Americans, um, mm -hmm. those two like paths intersecting in this strange way. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, she, uh, she, she, you know, she's like literally like dusting the, you know, the awards that Marvel has won, right? Like Stan Lee's in the apartment, you know. Um, and uh, and you know, but she's just invisible, right? She's right. not. She's not part of that story. Mm -hmm. And I think Santos. That that sort of wasn't good enough for Santos. He, mm -hmm. other members of his family worked in this kind of um, in these kinds of jobs, working in people's houses, cleaning, mm -hmm. cooking, and it just wasn't good enough for Santos. And he um, made up a story for his family and and for himself. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of, I guess that sort of American story. Um, you know, the title of your book, the, the subtitle is The Lying, Hustling, Grifting, Stealing, and Very American Legend of George Santos. So why do you call it a, a very American legend? Well, um, you know, a funny thing, uh, the legend piece of it, um, I didn't do this on purpose, but afterwards the lawyer who was vetting this book, uh, one of many people who vetted this book, um, Said to me, "Oh, like very smart to call it a legend because then you know you have a little bit of uh, leeway in terms of if he sues you. You know, <laughs> um, he has not sued me. He's also not 
uh, he's not pointed to a single word in this that's inaccurate. So, um, so that, that worked out well. But, um, you know, so, so I, I do, I, it's, it's all true, obviously, or, you know, as true as I could uh, ascertain. But I do think that there is a legendary aspect to this story, both the legends that he's telling about himself, right? And he's tapping into this long tradition in American history right. of um, tall, you know, people who are telling tall tales and, you know, storytelling about themselves and exaggerating. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're sitting in Gatsby territory, right? Sure. Um, and that's, I think, a lineage that Santos is both aware of and, and part of. Um, so, so I think, you know, definitely legendary. And I, I felt strongly that this is a really American story mm -hmm. that he, um, again, is sort of tapping into this long vein um, and is a great example of um, American politics, American culture, uh, American ethos, again, for good and bad, right? right? Because on the one hand, he is this total unknown who is able to sort of elevate himself, pull himself into the highest Cinderella you know, story. It's a yeah. true Cinderella yeah. story, you yeah. know? Um, and that's beautifully American, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, he did a lot of lying and stealing to do it, yeah. which again is very American, I think. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, on both counts. Um, so after, you know, uh, many years of hustling, stealing, grifting. Um, why does Santos turn to politics? This was, to me, one of the central questions of the book um, because it's such an open question, right? Why would you pick a field where journalists are going to be asking you questions, voters, by definition, are going to be asking you questions every time you see them in the street, right? Community groups, you have to file paperwork, right? None of these things are required of a normal citizen, right? Mm -hmm. He could have just lived his life grifting and stealing, hustling in a low way, mm -hmm. and just kind of gotten away with it, right? Um, so to me, that was, I, there were like one or two big questions for me about him, and this was definitely one of them. And I guess I have a few hypotheses. Um, there's some obvious ones, right? Certainly he did it for money. Um, mm -hmm. He you know, he found uh, plenty of ways to grift off the political system, mm -hmm. whether it was like charging for meals at Obaco um, or like more direct, like literally just pocketing campaign cash, right? Um, so clearly he thought it was a good way to make money. There's more sort of um, uh, kind of nuanced ways that he thought he could make money off politics that were even more specific, like for example, meeting donors who had a lot of money and becoming, you know, putting them in his Rolodex mm -hmm. and then doing sort of trying to do business with them, right? Which he, right. he did, in fact, do and got some money for. Mm -hmm. um, so that's certainly part of it. Um, I think that there's another piece of it that is a little bit of this kind of chip on his shoulder thing of the level of ambition that he wanted to mm -hmm. be, um, you know, kind of like raise his, his lot in life. Um, but there's another piece of this that, I, that I, is, you know, you, you see in the book, I, I think this is sort of different than what other people have said. I think that we can't deny that there's, there was a cultural pull for him yeah. with politics also, that, um, you know, con artists in American history, the ones that we remember, they, um, they, they get sort of swept up in the big cultural, like, um, ethos, the, the big sort of, the big sort of center of the pulsing heart of our culture, right? So, you know, you have Frank Abagnale also lying, but, you know, his lie was that he was a jet pilot, right? right. Catch sort of, me if you can. Catch me if you can, yeah. exactly. Um, you know, you have Elizabeth Holmes, who is, you know, sort of doing all these um, lying and all these lies and schemes about technology at the sort of height of Silicon Valley, right? Um, made off with Wall Street, right? People are drawn to the big thing, right, mm. um, of the moment. And we remember them because they were examples of the big thing, too. Sure. And for Santos, I think that's politics, right? I mean, what else was happening in the last few years other than politics in yeah. American culture? I mean, right. this was, people didn't, you know, weren't talking about baseball as much as, uh, as politics, right? And so I think he was drawn to it and also was drawn to the fact that it was messy and loud and kind of entertainment focused, right, in the, in the in, you know, during Donald Trump's rise, um, a guy that he modeled himself after. Yeah. So I think it's not so surprising that a person who was interested in entertainment, fame, celebrity, would then get pulled into politics. Sure. I mean, it would appear that 
George Santos and the, the historical times that we live in sort of met totally. and crossed paths directly. And, and he's a little bit of a almost like historical accident in that way, you know, that he gets raised up to the place he got raised up to um, through these coattail forces, right, of, um, you know, that we all saw here uh, in, you know, here on Long Island, but, yeah. um, and in New York generally. And so that, I think that was a big part of the story too. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll make a, a note at this point that um, even if you're already familiar, as I said, with the headlines of the story, um, Mark's book, I think, has a particularly um, fascinating insights into Long Island politics. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll turn to that for a little bit. Yeah. Um, so 2020 to 2024, there was a significant red shift in, in Nassau County. Um, can you explain some of that shift you know, and how it was different from uh, other things going on nationally? Yeah. Well, we all lived through it, right? Um, and it was, a, it was something that, you know, as a you know, sort of local regional reporter, I was um, writing about, reporting about, um, talking about a lot. And people on the national level were just totally not getting it, like not understanding what was happening here, right? Um, because it was different than the rest of the country. So obviously the center of it was bail reform, right? Mm -hmm. The changes to the state criminal justice system um, that Democrats enacted um, in, you know, that, that went into effect in 2020, right? Right. Right, as the, right as the pandemic also began, which sort of complicated things as well. Um, and so this was a, you know, it seemed very kind of wonky and, um, you know, maybe like, like wasn't going to sort of have a huge effect culturally at first, maybe when, mm -hmm. when sort of uh, people were planning it or talking about it. Um, and then obviously it goes into effect and it, uh, and it gets, it becomes this whole other thing, right? right. First of all, we didn't even have numbers to really talk about it with any, uh, you know, kind of tactile way, right? Um, we were all, we were just using anecdotes that was hard to tell, like whether this was things were increasing or not. Um, but certainly, it became a political movement where um, where Republicans were very sort of um, you know rallying people around this idea that people would uh, you know be be not held in jail waiting trial uh, mm -hmm. through monetary means. Of course, there was a lot of bad faith. Uh, you know, you, th th there's a lot of bad faith about this issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's, this is the, the system in a lot of ways that hadn't changed really that much at all. Um, mm -hmm. And it was these kind of anecdotal things that were shifting. Um, but certainly it was great politics. It was, it was something that, that Republicans used to win um, in, in the off-cycle races leading up to Santos's. And Santos had already been talking about it in 2020 as a couple of the Republicans had been. But it hadn't really like crystallized for the public then, mm -hmm. right? It was it was still kind of bubbling up as an issue. Yeah. Also, 2020 was the presidential year. Right. People were kind of focused on that. Um, but by 2022, this was hot. You know, this was yeah. a huge thing. Um, another thing, and, and by the way, Santos, um, as I write about in the book, is very good at latching on to these movements. He's mm -hmm. good at sort of. Um, sensing what a room wants to hear, mm -hmm. sensing kind of what is working well culturally. He's very sort of culturally acute. Um, and so he did that with bail. The other thing, the sort of, uh, sort of strange, um, I guess, uh, quirk of, of that year was that, you know, it was right after Roe v. Wade is, yeah. um, is repealed, right? And, um, and so, that was a huge uh, force around the country, and that was like pushing Democratic voters out yeah. to the polls, right? Um, and I think that a lot of Democrats thought the same thing would happen here. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't pan out quite the same way because in New York we have Democratic governor, it was a Democratic legislature, and there were further protections for abortion in New York. So it wasn't quite as much of a motivating factor as right. it was around the country. Um, and again, this is kind of a strange thing that maybe people wouldn't have thought of um, originally that had a huge effect on, on those races. Yeah. Could you just quickly, you mentioned it in the book, truth bias, Could explain for folks what that, what that means? Like the, sorry, you mean the, the idea that you would, um, that you so would that we, assume we can't, a politician. Yeah, exactly. Would, we can't yeah. doubt everything, otherwise it'd be hard to navigate our lives if I wasn't sure you know, the next right. step was going to be there, that we believe things on their face to be true. 
because you would, a, it would be very difficult to, um, to just kind of operate in the world otherwise, right? Yeah. Um, if you're assuming everyone is lying to you, it's crippling, right? Yeah. Um, and Santos benefited from this. This is something that's been studied. This is kind of a, a concept that, um, that governs our lives. Um, yeah. and, and even, I think this is what I wrote about in the book, even counterintuitively in politics. Like you right. would think that um, voters, citizens would um, be skeptical of politicians, right? Because we know that there's a lot of exaggeration in politics, mm -hmm. there's a lot of lying. Um, but counterintuitively, we still expect even politicians to be basically telling us the truth. Right. Um, and Santos really skated on that, right. uh, that, that reality. Sure. Um, so in the, in the book, you, you give, uh, I think, a, a good synopsis or background on the history of sort of the Republican Party machine here on Long Island. Um, and I guess my question is, how has the, the GOP changed, certainly in the last number of years, uh, as an example, um, they chose outsiders, really, mm -hmm. of the system, um, of the party system, Santos twice, and then most recently, Mozzie Pillup. So can you talk a little bit about GOP and where its history and, and how they changed? Totally. Well, so um, I think, again, what people outside Nassau County don't realize often is how strong the, um, the Republican Party is here, right? Um, because usually we think of the party machines as being urban things, right? Mm -hmm. Urban creatures and the big cities like New York or Chicago has like a political boss. Um, mm -hmm. But Nassau County was like that from early yeah. on, um, yeah. particularly for the GOP. Um, and for years, I mean, there's this incredible Reagan quote about, um, I think Reagan comes here for, it was like during one of his campaigns and says something to the effect of, you know, when a Republican goes to heaven, um, you know, dies and goes to heaven, it looks a lot like Nassau County. Mm -hmm. And that was a reflection <laughs> not of like how nice it is here, but, um, but about, the, um, about the machine and how powerful it was. And of course, that trips over into corruption and illegality sometimes, right? Yeah. When there's sort of kickback schemes as there have been repeatedly in Nassau County political history. Um, on the GOP side, particularly, yeah. um, but the uh, the system has endured, right? Mm -hmm. And there is a pretty um, tight uh, organization um, in in Nassau County that has given candidates a significant ground game. Mm -hmm. um, people who you know kind of work their way up the system and know the area really well, and can count on people who are gonna you know kind of foot soldiers who are gonna knock on the doors for them, right? Yeah. Um, and so that remains true, you know, from the you know '50s all the way up to the present. Mm -hmm. um, and Santos benefited from that. Right. The uh, what, what has been sort of, I think, what the Nassau GOP would like to say about itself these days is that um, they they have done a, a pretty sort of good job of re of of refreshing the base. Right. Mm. Um, there's a funny line in the book that uh, multiple people told me that. You know, there used to be a thing in Nassau County politics, um, you know, called, uh, for Republican politics, called something like Republican hair, right? And that would be, uh, you know, the hair that a typical Nassau Republican would have, which was, you know, you could think about it a little bit. It's white, uh, straight, slicked back, you know, you can picture it. You, you've all seen the pictures of, the, of these people. Um, and th that, so that was like kind of a joke that, okay, sure, a lot of these politicians have names that end with vowels like mine does. Um, but, the, um, but even that was a little bit, that stereotype was not exactly perfect because um, even from the beginning, the NASA machine would reach out to newcomers from the city, right, in Levittown, sort of knock on doors and sort of try to recruit even Democrats to the, to the party. So the, the machine has always been pretty good at, um, at finding new, new members, um, new foot soldiers. And so they, they have been doing that again in recent mm -hmm. years. I think realizing that you have to kind of change to um, adapt to live, mm -hmm. they've you know, found candidates in, in minority communities that might um, have otherwise gone Democratic, right? And I think Santos was an example of that, that was what the idea was with Santos. The thought was that maybe you get a sort of new type of candidate for, for the district. Um, and I think Mozzie as well, uh, Mozzie Pillip, who ran you know, against Swazi just recently. Um, Pillip, by the way, was, I think there's a real difference between Pillip and, and Santos in that 
Philip was, you know, kind of started at the low levels of Nassau County politics, right? She was a legislator um, and is, you know, I did a full term already. Um, that she was in her, she is in her second term, right? Um, at, at the point that she lost the congressional run. Santos was a total newcomer, yeah. um, unclear where he lived. He was kind of living in Queens, kind of living in Nassau. Um, and so, you know, really, like, he was not part of the machine, um, but certainly did bolster it, right? He yeah. donated a lot of money to the machine and kind of ingratiated himself, which is part of why they let him run. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's move to the, to the 2022 election in terms of um, the issue of vetting. You also described the, the perfect storm that occurs really with the 2022 election. Robert Zimmerman is the candidate. Mm -hmm. um, there's redistricting that goes on. Um, the primary is moved to August. Um, and again, as the, you were just referring to, the sort of a misreading of what the real issues were. So can you just flush that out a little bit? Yeah, I mean, everything goes right for Santos in this bizarre way. Um, in it, you could almost, it's almost the inverse of 2020. Where 2020, everything goes wrong for him. Where COVID happens, it's very hard to dislodge an incumbent when you can't even knock on doors, you know? Right. And strangely, Santos was taking COVID very seriously in 2020. Mm -hmm. He got it and seemed to have gotten very sick. Mm -hmm. um, everything went wrong that year. In 2022, it's all the opposite. He no longer is facing an incumbent, right? The district is redistricted to make it much more uh, Republican, mm -hmm. um, including some strongholds like Massapequa, right, in Lovetown. Um, and, um, and, and also, that redistricting happens late. So it's a little bit too late mm -hmm. to get a new candidate in there who would actually be part of the Republican machine, right? right. So he just gets very lucky. He also gets lucky that the Democratic candidate had a, uh, a pretty hot primary um, that right. ran pretty late. So the Democrat couldn't turn to Santos himself until um, September, mm -hmm. which is pretty late. Um, didn't have so much money couldn't, that couldn't spend um, to, to spend. Um, and then, of course, those uh, political forces like right. bail, um, anger about COVID mitigation strategies, school board stuff. Um, all these political issues that were really trending in the Republican direction. Mm -hmm. And he um, is wise enough or sort of uh, clever enough to, um, to harness those, really double down on them in ways that some of his colleagues didn't do, right? Mm -hmm. um, but he's really willing to kind of get in, you know, into the dirt on that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of sweeps him to victory. Sure. Um, so to talk about a little bit of, you describe, um, there's a quote, don't they vet these guys anymore? Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, you describe it, you know, that there's multiple sources of culpability, um, Democratic Party, the Republican Party, media, journalists. Um, so you describe it in some way as systemic failure mm -hmm. that, that occurred there. So it, would you describe this as a, as a bug or is this a feature now of our, of our politics today? I think that, you know, Every, again, everything went right for him, so he got lucky that um, the, um, I, I think of politics and culture generally as an ecosystem, mm -hmm. um, and there's like lots of little pieces of that ecosystem, all of which interact and kind of need to be working well um, if, to have a healthy uh, atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this storm was so perfect for him that it just like flooded the ecosystem, right? It was like... It was like a 10 foot wave into yeah. a marsh. Um, so that, I don't know that that will happen again, that everything will fail at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I don't think it's a bug. I think that this is um, a problem with the ecosystem right now mm -hmm. that, um, you know, in, in that, that, that has, you know, many, many little kind of side plots um, and many people are culpable. I mean, the media, right, like myself included, um, <laughs> We didn't, you know, we didn't sort of pull all the dots together until that great New York Times story in December. Right. Um, I will say that, you know, I was writing about Santos and wrote things about his lies and um, you know, sort of strangenesses. Like he w it wasn't clear where he lived. He was doing some weird campaign finance stuff with his first run where he was like paying for things that he shouldn't have been and raising money in weird ways. Um, I was writing about his kind of flip-flops and some weird uh, abortion stuff that he was doing, mm -hmm. so talking about. And other reporters were too. The Daily Beast and the North Shore Leader um, also raised sort of real questions about him. 
So there were people that were raising questions, even the Democratic um, you know, campaign arm, which is doing the opposition research, they found a lot of the things that we now know about Santos, like his nonprofit that was not actually a nonprofit with pets, right? Um, and his kind of sketchy um, Ponzi scheme-ish uh, company that he used to work for. So there's a lot of stuff out there that the yeah. media raised in total, but we didn't connect those dots. Um, and that's, you know, that's hindsight is twenty twenty. I wish we did, um, but it didn't get connected. Um, and then, you know, there were other failures, right, that, um, that I think the Democrats picked the wrong issues to focus on in this election. Who knows if that would have changed anything, but um, certainly there were there, the issues that they were sort of running ads on and thinking about were ones that worked nationally, but not locally at all. Yeah. Um, so I, again, I, I think I would encourage everybody to, to definitely check out Mark's book, because in terms of what you're talking about, I think it takes the subject matter um, and takes it to another level in terms of this story in the, the context of politics today, politics here on Long Island. And I think that's one of the fresh perspectives that we get. Thank uh, you. I, I, hopefully, too, it's fun to read. You know, it's, it is. Uh, it's, a, it it's is. a weird story. He's a weird guy. I went to Brazil for a month, by the way, which we didn't really talk about, um, yeah. to, to check out the drag situation. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's fun. I mean, I, that, that was sort of one of, the, one of the, the, you know, the big questions were like, why did he go into politics? What does this mean for politics today? There were some little questions that I had to answer, too, like, mm -hmm you know, was he actually a drag queen? You know, um, this was one of the allegations. And he himself said, no, like I did it once at a festival, like no big deal. Um, and so I kind of had to figure this out. And mm -hmm. when I went down there, I talked to a bunch of people who said quite the opposite, that this was like a, you know, a real interest for him. Mm -hmm. um, but the key, and this is one of my favorite scenes in the book, um, came when I found and uh, convinced to um, talk to me, the, uh, his drag mentor, um, mm, right. who uh, you know, taught him, allegedly, everything that he knew about, uh, about dressing in drag. Um, and the, this, this person's stage name was Aola Rochard. And so you know, I talked to Aola a few times just to kind of understand what she, what she taught Santos and um, you know, their lives together. And it was useful, and it was interesting. And I followed Aola around to the beach and sort of like listened to her quite a bit. Um, but it, I sort of only got it when finally Aola said, listen, I don't do this often, but I'm doing a performance um, in, uh, in this club, and if you want to come, you can see it, and you know, that, you'll, you'll be able to see what Santos learned. And so I go, and um, a bunch of funny things happen as I go. First of all, I show up, and it's a sex club, and only men are allowed in. Uh, my wife had come with me because she was curious, and they sort of shooed her away. Um, and you know you go in and they you can purchase sex if you'd like um, for very cheap and uh, I did not do that but I did sit and watch the performance and you know the first few performances are very sexual in nature and it's you know essentially like you go to a strip club and it's that kind of performance um, and I'm sort of like clutching my beer in the back, like trying to take notes under the table. Um, I don't speak any Portuguese, by the way. So this was all, this was all, I'm sort of figuring this out. Um, and, uh, and my translator decided not to come that night because he, I was, thanks oh, a lot. Boy. Thanks, Gustave. <laughs> Appreciate it. Perfect timing. Um, but, uh, you know, I, so finally the mentor comes on and um, what's so amazing to me is that it's like the whole sort of, uh, l sort of lustful aspect of the evening just like falls away mm -hmm. and it's just it's this um, this man just as a woman um, in you know kind of beautiful clothes he's like flowing dresses um, lip syncing like making jokes being very funny but also looking very beautiful and um, and just being very entertaining and it's the exact costume that Santos was you know those pictures of Santos um, wearing and, and it sort of clicked for me. I was like, oh, okay, this is what Santos learned. This is exactly who he learned it from. And this probably was what he was doing. This is why he was doing this. That for him, it was about changing yourself, you know, looking beautiful. Um, he's, he's obsessed with his appearance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just being someone different, transforming. Um, and so I think it was kind of key to my understanding of his psyche at that stage. Yeah. Um, so to get back to some of the, I guess, 
consequences, um, perhaps, um, of the George Santos story. Um, can you sort of, you know, just describe a little further what you feel is sort of the current state of news media and journalism today? You know, that there's news deserts, um, the, the um, you know, undermining of, of local um, journalism, rising tide of lies and misinformation. Mm -hmm. So just your quick take on sort of the, you know, where journalism and news media is today. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, we don't, it's, it's complicated because we don't exactly live in a news desert here, obviously, um, where there's lots, of, there's lots of TV news. Newsday, where I worked until I started doing the book, um, I left to write the book. Um, but you know, Newsday is, is here and covers the, you know, the island as best it can. Um, and other papers sort of cycle in and try to pitch in as well, right? Um, so it's not like we don't have coverage here and it's not like, like I mentioned before, it's not like no one was writing anything about Santos. Um, I think that, but we do have a bunch of problems even in a place where we do have some media coverage. Mm -hmm. um, We've lost, I think, myself included, the um, the sort of routine of news, um, of news consumption, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I do my best to kind of, you know, read read local news and kind of have a bunch of different sources, but um, by and large, you know, we most people, hopefully, probably, you guys are all different since you're here today, but many people do not do the kind of wake up in the morning and read three newspapers cover to, to you know, front cover to back cover. Um, and once we've dropped that routine where it's sort of like, oh, I'll check a couple articles, you know, on the phone, I'll like read Twitter a little bit, um, we're directed into the stuff we're interested in already, right? right. Um, right. Which does not provide a full picture of the world we live in. Right. Um, it also, I think, makes us more partisan because we're just like primed to believe certain things. We don't see sort of the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and it also just kind of reduces the level of community that we feel for each other, right? Yeah. I mean, I, my brother is also a newspaper guy, um, started working at the Daily News in sports, and he's always been a sports um, reporter and editor. Um, and I think that sports journalism is super important because it's like, the peop I think his first article was like about a high school, um, maybe baseball game. Um, and you know, people of, who are on any side of the political spectrum pick up the paper because they want to see their son or daughter's name in the paper, you know, for their, that whatever, that track meet or that um, baseball game or something. And, and then you picked up the paper, now you'll look at the front page and you'll see, oh, something with assessment. <laughs> Always true. Um, <laughs> right. But uh, you know, like you, you'll at least have some understanding of what's going on in your community, and you'll have a connection to that community too, right? right. And the reason I bring up sports is because sports is kind of a, um, you know, you were there, you were at the game, like I'm saying you, as it, like you're the athlete or the parent, you saw what happened, you saw that there was a score, you saw someone won and lost you will see that basically accurately reflected in the newspaper, right? right. You right. will maybe have some quibbles about like, oh, I thought Johnny was better than this reporter said Johnny was or something. Maybe there will be an error, but if there's an error, it will be corrected the next day, right? Because that's mm -hmm. the ethos of newspapers, is that we correct our work mm -hmm. um, yeah, as, as, as often, as much as we should. Um, and so that, that sort of understanding of what a newspaper does and what journalism does um, I think bleeds over to political coverage too, right? Mm -hmm. If you, you'll give the reporter the benefit of the doubt because he or she you know, lives somewhere around here and mm -hmm. shows up to the events that you go to or that you want to hear about and they're a human being that is not lying to you. Right. Maybe right. they'll make mistakes, maybe they'll um, you know, be unfortunately like you know, blinkered in, in their writing in some ways, but they'll try their best and they are presenting you with the world, or at least an attempt at the world, right? And, um, but when we don't have that routine of reading the newspaper or reading, your, or sort of viewing media in some form all the time, often at a community level, I think then we start to mistrust each other, um, we start to not really understand what's going on around us, and then we start to believe lies. Um, and that's yeah. where we're at today. Yeah. Um, again, I think it's something that you cover well here uh, in, in the book. There's a, um, another, I think, quote here from the book. This is America, country of delusions, as I think we referred to earlier. So you, um, you wrote an op-ed uh, to the New York Times back uh, November 18th, I believe, uh, 
the title of it was George Santos is More Dangerous Than You Know. Um, and you described some of the intense polarization uh, in our current political climate, a win at all costs mentality. Um, so I'm just gonna quote from that and, then, and have, have you respond. So with local reporting verging on moribund and mostly getting worse, all politics has become national. Members of Congress have taken note, some still focus on constituent work and try to rise in the ranks, but others in gerrymandered districts see social media clout as a simpler route to donations and re-election. Conspiracy theories and misinformation become ways to get notoriety and signal your fighting spirit. So George Santos' story is really a symptom of these larger problems. So I guess what, what's, what's the lesson here um, yeah. and what are the warning signs perhaps that we, we take from this story? Well, I think this, I do believe this thing very strongly that um, politics, it used to be that you would say, you know, all politics is local. This was this old sort of saying that was true um, typically for most people, like most people cared about the things that were happening in their backyard. Um, now, I think it's very much the opposite because of those echo chambers and us being, um, you know, not having as much local reporting as we should. Um, I think that most people, when they think of politics, they think of presidential politics, and they think of these huge issues um, on the national level. Um, and of course, that's super important, right? I mean, these are matters of war and peace. These are matters of you know, consequential legislation. The federal government has access to funds that you know, local governments don't, right? So I'm not saying that we shouldn't be focused on national politics and should be ignoring local national politics. But I think what happens um, when you aren't sort of, if you don't know much about local politics or you're not sort of like thinking that much about it, is that um, you fall into these camps. Because on the big national issues and international issues, we are divided pretty intensely, right? There's like your, your, your pro-choice or your, um, or your anti-choice, right? Like there, there's not that much middle ground on that national kind of question. Um, I shouldn't say that, there's certainly middle ground, but in terms of voting, it's kind of one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, on the local level, there's not as much disagreement about certain things, right? I mean, mm -hmm. highways and uh, wetland protection and, um, you know, uh, Fire Island, you know? I mean, there's yeah. just sort of, uh, there's, Republicans and Democrats don't really disagree on a lot of environmental things on this local level, mm -hmm. even as, I mean, I remember Lee Zeldin coming in for an endorsement interview. Um, Lee Zeldin, the former congressman, ran for governor um, when he was still in Congress, and he was. This was early on. He was sort of um, being sort of skeptical about uh, climate change because that was the big national issue that people were talking about, and it was a litmus test. You know, you couldn't be Republican couldn't b believe in climate change. Meanwhile, he actually has like an okay record on local environmental issues. You know. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it was kind of like, I always thought to myself, like, why don't we just think more about these local things that matter to us here, like, you know, what sort of gets constructed and, you know, what we, like, how we build and, um, and you know, how we protect our environment and schools and whatever. Why don't we focus more on that where there is more agreement and you as an individual have more effect, right? There's not as many voters in an assembly district as there is, as there are in the country. Yeah. Um, this is like a super boring thing that my editor and my wife made me take out of this book, but um, you're well, welcome. I've yeah, brought yeah, it back I for yeah, you. yeah, yeah. I, I stuck <laughs> it back in. Um, but I believe I wrote a lot about um, when I was writing about New York City politics, um, participatory budgeting, which is this um, sort of fun innovation where basically like a certain number, you know, the city council members in New York agreed to take like a certain portion of the budget and release it and say, okay, the voters of my council district will vote on how to use this money. It wasn't a huge amount of money, um, but it was something. It had to be for capital projects. And it's this incredible thing where you go into a library like this one or a school gym or something, and you just hear other people's proposals for how to spend government money. And one of the things, or a certain number of those things, is gonna happen because you vote on it. And you know there can be like, 200 people that are making these decisions, like the people that come out and vote on the, in these things. And I think that that sort of reminds you, oh yeah, I'm like a citizen is like a more active role than just watching Fox or MSNBC. You know, mm -hmm. you are supposed to know things and you are, your opinion matters and your uh, vote matters. 
Um, and I think we sort of forget that when mm -hmm. all we're talking about is these national issues that we have no effect over. Um, so I'm very pro-local and uh, mm -hmm. you know, think that we should all be focused in that, on that level. Yeah, well to get local, I think, um, you know, as I, I started at the beginning, I said we've re really watched this all play, is continuing to play out in, in real time. Uh, we had the special election t a couple of weeks ago. I believe today, uh, Tom Swazi was That's sworn right, yeah. in um, right. to Congress. Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts on Swazi's win and, and what role did Santos, George Santos play in that? It seems like it was a real Santos rejection, right? Um, or, or at least that was a piece of what was going on. Um, I was kind of surprised by it, honestly. I, I, I thought it was going to be really close um, and was surprised by how, how you know, um, strong he wa his win margin was. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of things happen there. It's a complicated race, obviously. Um, I think that uh, immigration got, I, I wrote a piece for Politico magazine about the campaign. I was sort of following the candidates on the campaign trail a little bit, and it was jarring how much people were talking about immigration. Um, and again, it was this kind of return to national issues, I thought, when we had actually been talking, not about local issues, but about these state things like bail reform, right? These sort of strange um, New York uh, quirks of the district, um, as opposed to Israel and, um, and, and, um, and immigration. And it was this shift back to those big things, which I think were like presidential year things. So I think that was, a, one, that was part of what was going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what the lesson is of Swazi winning, but I do think that both parties really tested their messaging on immigration on all of our televisions. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and we're going to see a lot more of that, I think, in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the months leading up to the presidential election. Yeah. So I just have a couple more questions. Then we're going to take some questions uh, from the folks in the audience here. Um, so I, I did also read today that there was a, a new districted maps that came out as well. And I think the third congressional now does not include Massapequa. Can you talk right. a little bit about why that's significant? And I think significant? it goes a little into Suffolk, right? <laughs> was there applause? That's hilarious. Um, um, uh, it, it was so, and I, I, sh I should be clear, I haven't looked that carefully at the lines yet. They've been sort of, uh, they've been, it's been sort of trickling out the information about it. But, um, you know, the br broadly, this was, um, the Democrats are being, I think, careful about not wanting to sort of um, gerrymander too, too much mm -hmm. because that's what happened last time and right. then the maps got, got thrown out by, yeah. um, by the courts. So um, I think that the impulse here was to just tweak and not uh, make huge changes. Um, and it seems like what happened was they made uh, CD2, Andrew Garbarino's district, a little more Republican, right. right? It already is held by a Republican, and uh, that, I guess, safeguards uh, the Democratic-held seats right now. Right. Um, seat. <laughs> Swazi is right, the only one. Right. <laughs> um, can you just talk a little bit more about what is in the near future for George Santos? Yeah, I mean, he has significant legal issues ahead of him. Mm -hmm. um, his you know, jury selection for his federal trial starts September 9th, I think, um, mid-September, and that's coming, you know, yeah. whether he wants to or not. He, yeah. can, he could take a plea deal. Um, that seems less and less likely because he had, doesn't have the bargaining chip of uh, office to, to bargain. Um, so he, you know, he, seems to, he seems to be sort of uh, receding a little from the public eye. Um, the cameo thing seems to have passed a bit. Cameo is the place where you could buy um, you know, videos uh, where he'll, Santos will like, say something and you pay him to do that. Um, I talked to the um, head of Cameo who said he like, broke records for the first, I think, day, week, and month of Cameo usage. Um, mm -hmm. Which is, is our George, you know, record breaking. <laughs> um, but um, so I think that he has, you know, most likely jail, prison ahead of him. Um, but then I think he has different paths, right? He mm -hmm. could uh, he could disappear, go out of the public eye, um, or he could try to kind of reclaim this, um, you know, kind of perch of entertainment and celebrity and um, zaniness that he attained before. Um, and and we'll see. I you know he'll he could be a good podcast person. I think. <laughs> sure, um, I, I think I would listen. I would, yeah, I would yeah, be yeah, curious. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess that's maybe my my last question for now is, um, in terms of 
again, sort of the broader ramifications of, of George Santos and our, and our current political climate. You know, we have uh, artificial intelligence, turbocharging disinformation. People are kind of, as you mentioned before, we're sort of choosing our own reality. Um, and, you know, it does seem that there's kind of a, a lack of political <laughs> courage, really, uh, from both parties uh, in terms of the political climate. So, it, and I think you discuss it here in the book, um, are there, are there more George Santoses to come, and are they going to be, you know, not as maybe sloppy or messy in terms of how they manipulate the the system, as it were? I think so. I mean, we, you know, sort of approval of members of Congress is at historic lows, right? With good reason, um, because so many members of Congress are in it, you know, not even to rise the ranks and kind of do the work that uh, members of Congress do, but um, in it mostly for like fame and um, ridiculousness and fundraising, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I call it a sort of shameless caucus in the book. Obviously, right. Marjorie Taylor Greene um, is one of them, a good friend of Santos's. Um, and so we are seeing more of that, I think. Um, I think that there's certain structures that uh, make that more common, right? Mm -hmm. Social media being one of them. Mm -hmm. You can fundraise over social media in ways that you ha couldn't in previous eras, right? Mm -hmm. You can get famous on social media around the country, you know, yeah. even for like one small district. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think we've seen the last person to do something like this. Um, and it kind of depends on what we all do and how the ecosystem adapts, I think, uh, yeah. whether we sort of reject this style of politics. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I know we didn't go through all of the, 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 I think, entertaining and salacious details that you included in the book, as well as this, I think, you know, more uh, powerful or meaningful message that you have in this book and, and also... Um, you know, insight into our, our local politics. I think it's it's all in there in the book. I certainly encourage you all to, to pick up a copy and, and, and check it out. Um, but I think what we're gonna do is now take some questions from the audience. Sounds Mark, great. you stay put. I'm gonna go to my Phil Donahue and run around the all audience right. here. Amazing. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, let's have a round of applause for Mark. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. At every one of these things, I wonder if Santos is going to come. Let's see him. That did come up. I was asked the first, that a the couple times. The first one I did was like the day, the day before I think he got kicked out, and I was in D.C. and there was a guy in the back of the room that kind of looked like him, and I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> wow. Anyway, wow, it wasn't him. <laughs> we have a question here. Yeah, I've been to Brazil. Uh, few times and I know you hated that assignment. It was tough, yeah. It was, it was hardship, tough. yeah. <laughs> Did you get to Manaus? No, I was in uh, Rio and Niteroi, which is where his family was from mostly. Yeah. But I wish yeah, his, uh, the other half of his family is there. I wish I'd made uh, it. <laughs> it. It's obvious that uh, George Santos uh, fibbed about his life, his experiences, and who knows what else. But what I'm particularly curious about from your examination of the uh, person did he intend to, or did he want to be a good and proper representative for the district? That's a good question. Um, I don't think that he, I don't think that he even knew what that would mean. You know, um, I mean, he wasn't. He, he, he. I, and I, I'm not even really joking. I mean, he was. There are upsides and downsides of strong machine systems, right, and strong political parties. Um, the downsides are myriad, and we're all familiar with them. Um, like, you know, kind of keeping people away from politics, corruption, et cetera. The upsides are that they are training grounds, right? And you learn about, um, you learn about what a politician does. You learn about the business of constituent work. Um, it's just sort of, a, it's like an education. And he had none of that, right? He jumped right to Congress, which it's bizarre that we think of Congress as like, local office or like low level office, but it's obviously not. It's you. It's a hugely important. There's been, I used to know the number at one point, but it's like maybe 10,000 total members of Congress in American history, and George Santos was one of them. You know, like this is a big deal. Um, and it's a difficult, it can be a difficult job. The constituent work alone is, um, is challenging and really important, right? That's the way that we interact with the government most often is when, federal government is when we need a passport or something, right? We have a problem with our PPE loan. Um, and he was totally um, not prepared for that. He did have some staff members who were professionals who like knew how to do these things, but they were totally overwhelmed. And 
you know, I think the message goes down from the top. This was not what he was focused on. Um, and he, I think he could have, again, these were choices he could have made. He could have come into Congress, um, you know, put his head down, said, okay, you got me. <laughs> I lied about everything, but uh, I'm here now and I'm going to do a good job until, I, until the, next, the next race. And I think that could have totally changed his whole, um, his whole future, right? Um, putting aside the scheming and grifting he was doing. Um, but if it was just like biographical lies and then he decided to be a decent representative, I don't know. I bet lots of Republicans would have voted for him again. Um, and so his choice not to do that, I think, is a bit of, shows you kind of what's going on in his head, that it is, it's about something else for him. It's about the attainment of the office and it's about kind of ambition and entertainment more than policy. Yeah, another question. Among his lies, one of the most appalling was that his grandparents were Holocaust survivors. What do you make of that? What do you think drove him to do that? What was his reason? Yeah, um, it was a, so this is one of his more cynical lies, I think. Um, and it's one that I traced, I traced in the book because I, I got some really good advice from a, a former Newsday colleague of mine, a great investigative reporter, Sandra Petty, who said, I said, I was like, Sandra, just tell me, how, how do I do this? <laughs> and she said, uh, she was like, it's simple. Just put everything in order. <laughs> and I, I, it's kind of true. It's all it takes, or you can learn a lot by just getting the chronology down. Um, and I learned, for example, um, some interesting things about his first fake marriage. Um, just by figuring out the chronology of like when it started, when it ended, when he left certain jobs. Anyway, um, I think, and the same thing with the Jewish lie was tracking when he started telling this lie and how it developed because it, it wasn't the it didn't start the way it ended. Um, you know, by the end he was saying my father's faith, which was Catholic, and my mother's faith, which was Jewish, and mine. Like he was just literally saying I am Jewish. In the beginning, he was kind of telling basically the truth, which was that there was a family story about maybe Jewish ancestors very far back, um, and he was just kind of like telling people about that. But then as he like gets more attuned to politics and um, is like speaking in front of Jewish audiences, that story changes, and now he starts weaponizing it and sort of using it. Um, and it's a, it's a district with one of the largest percentages of Jewish voters in the country, right? Um, so not surprising. Um, so I think there's a little bit of like cynicism um, and also just like weirdness with him that he just, he can't help himself, you know? He's just always telling stories. Another hand here. Could you see a scenario where if Santos is facing a long prison term, he could just flee back to Brazil? <laughs> he has dual citizenship, I think, where he could. Uh... Um, this, yeah, the dual citizenship thing is funny because the, I, I can't remember, the exact confirmation of that, but one um, one sort of way that I verified that he wasn't, in, in fact, an American citizen was that someone sent me a picture of his passport. <laughs> I was like, this is a weird journey that I've been on with him. That I've seen a picture of his passport. I've been sent pictures of him naked in bubble baths. Like, it's been a weird journey. Um, but um, yeah, the, in terms of fleeing to Brazil, um, great question. I mean, I don't really know. I, I, Imagine it's hard to get on an airplane, you know. Um, certainly his lawyer a few um, uh, court appearances ago had requested a little bit more leniency to his, um, to his terms, his geographic terms, um, because he wanted to go shopping, <laughs> which is very funny. Um, and people thought that was hilarious. But so, um, so I think the court is kind of like aware of where he is. Um, and I I believe he had to surrender his passports. Um, I think that's the way it works. Um, and um, so, I, so I don't know. I'm, it's, it's, uh, it's a funny thing to imagine. But I certainly think, that to the beginning of your question, um, there were a lot of things that I wrote about in the book that he's alleged to have done that he did not get charged for. So he's facing you know, a decent cohort of years or, or right now. There could be more coming too. There's nothing to stop the federal government from another superseding indictment. Um, so he's he's not in good shape. We have another question here. Um, so so we know that um, he used his campaign as a grift, um, but some people have speculated that he 
campaigned for that reason with the intention of losing. That, that was the whole purpose of the campaign and that he would have gotten away with it if he had in fact lost. And I just wonder if you have any insight into whether that's true. Right, I know this sort of producer's idea, right? Um, I, and I, I write about that a bit in the book. Because um, there is definitely an element of him you know, doing a producer's-ish grift where he um, is less focused on winning and more focused on how am I going to make money off this run. Um, that is certainly what's happening. I mean, and some of the stuff um, is serious, like the um, using campaign funds for Botox, right? I mean, you know, just like really egregious stuff um, that had nothing to do with winning, right? I mean, the Ilbaco, you know, going to Ilbaco and using campaign funds, a lot of politicians do that genre of thing, and it's not great, but that's like one thing. The Botox is another thing. Um, so there's that. Um, I, I grapple with that question too, the producer's question, um, but I do think that he, um, he seemed to be like in it to win it, you know? The, there were a couple moments where he made choices that I don't think you would choose if you, if you didn't want to win. Um, and I described this one scene in uh, 2020, um, which is after he loses definitively to Tom Swazi, loses by like double digits, um, he's just not, not even close. But because of the quirks of absentee balloting, on election night, he's up, right? This was 2020, the COVID year, a lot of Democrats voted by mail. So he pretended that he won, even though everyone knew he lost. And he goes to um, new member orientation. Um, and, and I wrote about this, because it was shocking. It was like everyone and their mother knew that he'd lost, and yet he's showing up in DC as if he's gonna be the next member of Congress. Um, and I, ta I wrote about you know, people just saying like, what is he doing here? Like what a joker or whatever. Um, and so you know, on one level you think, oh, this is just more of the grift. Um, but then um, I looked at all the videos of him. He's posting videos of himself constantly from down there um, and what he's saying and the sort of like awe that he's um, experiencing upon going to DC and like, you know, and they really wine and dine you, you know? Um, and so I did some reporting on like exactly what he was doing down there. Um, and I do think that there was a way that he went down there, realized how kind of cool this could be, how much more money he could make, you know, by actually winning, by being a member of Congress. Um, and, th and immediately he commits to running again. Um, so I do think he was interested in winning. I don't think he was like trying to actively lose um, at all. Um, at, at certainly not in 2022. We have a, another question back here. Thank you. Uh, I think your book would have been better entitled A Fabulist. I think uh, instead of following what Trump may have done, I think following Biden is more likely. He goes rags to riches. I mean, if you follow Biden's past, uh, when he was running for Senate, claiming that he graduated from the University of Delaware with three degrees, that after he graduated he got an appointment to the Naval Academy that he turned down, that he went to law school on a full scholarship and finished in the top of his class, when in reality he got one degree from the University of Delaware, never got an uh, appointment from the Naval Academy, got a uh, scholarship predicated on need, half scholarship to law school, and finished 76 out of 85 in his graduating law school class, uh, claimed that he had been at Selma or that he had been in South Africa and was arrested in an attempt to see Nelson mm -hmm. Mandela. All these things are false. I see don't what you're you saying. Think, don't you think that he followed that path more where he's taking stolen valor and things like nature of the Holocaust, uh, Santos referring to the Holocaust, he's referring to Nelson Mandela? So, um, you know, it's funny, I, Biden is actually mentioned in the book. Um, in the, uh, in, at the end of the book, there's a, there's a sort of discussion of the, um, you know, kind of the technology, the, our technological world that we live in now. Um, and um, I mentioned the famous uh, Biden speech, right, where he, um, you know, kind of plagiarizes. Um, and it was, again, this, you have to look, look at the chronology because at the first versions of the speech, he accurately quotes what he says he's quoting. And then, you know, he starts 
you know, dropping the attribution. Anyway, um, what I write in the book is that, you know, back then it took a long time for everyone to kind of figure out what had happened there. Now you would, uh, you know, immediately, all the social media would be lit up with uh, Biden dropped attribution from whatever, Biden is lying about this. Um, and so this is the different worlds we live in, that, um, that now there is much more like, uh, you're, you're much uh, more vulnerable to, um, to these things being found out. Um, I, I think that there's a distinction between um, politicians either lying about their background or exaggerating their background or uh, storytelling about their background, because there's a long tradition of that in American politics. Um, um, I think there's a distinction between that and wholesale like making up a uh, history for yourself, which is what Santos was doing, um, as well as um, very cynically um, like just grifting off politics, not in the sort of skimming off the top Ilbaco thing that we've been talking about, but in like literally just taking money f in from one person's hand into your pocket. Um, and I think that this is what makes Santos different, as well as the sort of shamelessness that Santos, um, you know, sort of sort of had and embodied. That he um, did was totally uninterested in governing, totally uninterested in policy. Um, this was not like a means to an end. It wasn't like, oh, well, I'm in this business and I'm going to make uh, a living off this business. Um, this was like the only thing that he was doing was making money. So we're gonna. Um, so we're going to, I think, just take a couple more questions here, and then I uh, want to make sure that there's enough time we have for Mark to sign books. Hi. Hi, Mark. This is Teodora. I have a question Hello. for you. How did you find me? <laughs> we were just talking about this. Um, Teodora um, very kindly spoke to me for, um, for the book, so there's a whole chapter about Teodora's experience. Um, yeah. And how, how did you find me? Let's you focus were, on that. yeah, um, mm -hmm. and so Teodora was a um, voted for Santos, right? Tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but voted for Santos, and then was very sort of upset about it, and was sort of telling reporters this, and like very kind of active in the sort of anti-Santos um, world, and um, and so yeah, so I saw your name from these uh, from these clips, and then and then called you about it, and we we talked. How you know, did you get my number? You'd be so surprised at how everyone's number is available. There's something called People Finder. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's called People Finder. Anyway, um, you would so be surprised. So you searched my name on People Finder. Yeah, yeah, and everyone's okay, stuff is available. It's good to have that on the record. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, just just to let you know, uh, an update from Santos. He's actually very active on Twitter Spaces, so that's right. I know he's blocked you, but um, yeah. make a fake account and listen in. <laughs> it's very interesting what he's doing right now, and it's. I know. He's, he's I know. taken on a new uh, persona. He's learned things, I guess, in mm -hmm. Congress. And mm -hmm. now he, uh, he's fully utilizing them for his, I guess he is young, as he keeps saying. Um, so I dropped in on a few just out of curiosity. Yeah. And it's pretty mind blowing. He it actually, is. on one of them, was saying he's going to run again. Yeah, no, <laughs> he's sure been saying where, that. I know. He said Florida, politics. maybe. No, and this is, um, you know, Jeff mentioned this Times piece I wrote, but that I talked about his Twitter space, Santos's Twitter spaces, appearances there, um, which I found, like, in some ways more kind of um, uh, aggravating and dangerous than some of his biographical lies, because there he's talking about, you know, should the US go into a police state? And should we go door to door for like vague reasons? This was after the Hamas attack on Israel, um, and you know, saying that we should arrest people just because they go to a protest, like kind of wild, wild stuff. But this is the register that you know Santos kind of excels in is just kind of making these things up. Um, I, he called it himself, throwing ideas out there, um, and you know, fine for some dude on a podcast, not so fine for a member of Congress or even a former member of Congress now. I, when the story broke in, in the Times, not our alma mater Newsday, unfortunately, what amazed me is that first the reaction was the Nassau GOP machine blamed the Democrats for not vetting him. And then <laughs> later, and I, you know, I local interest in politics, and I thought, well, is it Robert Zimmerman's fault or was it Tom Swasey? And then you, it really just gets you pointing fingers at them rather than the Democrats 
who probably knew something about Santos when he first ran against Swazi, but certainly the Nassau County Republican machine, which is so vaulted for its power, did they know more than they let on? And did you feel, when you're looking back, who stood out as a possible hero in the Bob Green Newsday world of investigated heroes? <laughs> you mean who, who should have stood out? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think that, again, this is sort of uh, this ecosystem question. Um, I think that, as you know, Newsday doesn't have as many people as we had in the Bob Green era. Um, I was writing two pieces a day about the congressional campaigns. Um, it's a lot of words and a lot to, to do. Um, at least two, sometimes it was three. Um, you know, this is not, you don't have the time to do, to do these deep dive investigations. Um, I, hindsight is twenty twenty. I did, um, I, I still think this is the right move. I, my, my sort of uh, thesis, um, or sort of like, the, the, the way I sort of op was operating was that if something was m significant to a campaign, then I think it should be checked out. You know, like, are you saying this on the campaign trail all the time? Is this like what you're running on? Then we really do have to check it and we shouldn't be repeating it. So for example, um, you know, Nick Lalota was uh, often made a big deal about having gone to Annapolis, right? Um, you know, being a Navy man and going to Annapolis. That's a big deal. You, you check that kind of thing because it's significant. Um, so I did, I filed public records requests and followed up with the Navy 15 times and you know, got on the phone and said why I needed to know and ultimately found out, yes, he did go to Annapolis. You know? um, and that's what typically happens, but I'm glad I did it. You know, it's good vetting. I think you know, Congressman Lolota probably wouldn't mind either because it was true and you know, it's, this is how the ecosystem works. Do I wish I did that with Santos, with Baruch? Yes, you know, I wish I did. I do think that would have been the thread. I think that's the thread for the times too, but I think that would have been the thread that pulled everything else um, apart. Um, so I wish I did that. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, do we have time, do we have reporting power to do that for every single one? Um, and does something as dumb as that uh, matter? You know, like should, it, I don't know. It's a question, it's an open question. I'm wondering now, should we be checking everyone's college, uh, you know, um, transcripts? Maybe, but, or is that a huge waste of time that you'd rather a reporter be focused on, you know, speaking to voters, looking at legislative records? I don't know. It's a difficult question, um, but certainly one that Santos raises, for sure. So I, um, I know we've been taking a, a look at some pretty heavy subjects here. So I'm going to maybe ask you to finish off with an anecdote that, that I'm familiar with, um, which is, it's a very short little clip that uh, George Santos put out, his Let's Go Mets chant. Could oh you share God. that story with us? <laughs> I don't know yeah. if anybody has seen this clip. I certainly... Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and I do want to get back to the Mets one, too. But the, um, in the, so, um, the, there is something called the Goldwater Rule, um, which uh, is, uh, I'm going to mangle this, this is not my field, but basically mental health professionals um, do not are, are not, are sort of ethically bound to not um, talk about a patient that they have not, you know, uh, seen, right? And this became, this is called the Goldwater Rule because there is this very hilarious, and I encourage you to look up this article that, I can't remember what it was, maybe Esquire, some magazine article about Goldwater where a bunch of you know, mental health professionals are quoted calling him essentially a psychopath or like maybe even bipolar, I can't remember, but something intense and saying why he shouldn't be president. Now, maybe he shouldn't have been president for other reasons, but I think that the feeling was that this article was not you know, fair game. These people hadn't you know, diagnosed him, like how can you kind of say something like that? So for decades, that was the norm, is that you won't diagnose in public. Trump changed things, right? That we've, we've all read articles about, about people diagnosing Trump. Um, so I went to some mental health professionals and asked them about Santos. I was like, what do you think is going on here? And most of them cited that Goldwater rule and saying, like, look, I'm not going to really be able to tell you anything real without sitting down with him. But what some people pointed me towards, and what I mentioned in the book, is something called Pseudologia Fantastica which is basically like a catch-all for a few things, including like narcissistic personality disorder. Um, but essentially what it is is that 
you at least sometimes um, believe the lies that you're telling. Um, and those lies are like lurid and big in nature and not told simply for personal gain. Um, so the classic example is like someone who pretends to have a war wound, you know, and really believes that they had a war wound, right? And so Santos does not, you know, have a war wound, does not serve in the army or anything. But um, I do think that that is a bit of what's going on in his head sometimes, like this inveterate lying, like lying without being able to help it. Um, he recently has said that he's on the autistic spectrum too, which I, who knows, that word gets thrown around a lot these days. Um, but uh, but that's that is that is his latest excuse. Um, Anyway, uh, it's but it's a very it's a fascinating question. Um, yeah, yeah, I met him a couple times um, for Newsday, and I spoke to him on the phone a bunch of times, um, also for Newsday. For the book itself, um, I obviously got in touch and told him I wanted to interview him, and I really didn't know what was going to happen. At first, I thought maybe he would. You know, who knows? He's a weird guy. Like maybe he'd want it. Maybe he'd just embrace this. Um, but he did not. <laughs> um, he did one time pick up when I called from a different phone number. Um, and he just yelled at me for a while, hung up, called me back to yell at me again, um, basically just saying he wouldn't answer questions. And then I would periodically text him over the period of the book, um, asking him, you know, like, will you talk? Will you speak with me? Finally saying, like, OK, will you just fact check with me? Like, I'll tell you, essentially, the main points that are in the book. Uh, which is a tall order, it's a long book, you know. Um, but I was like, let's meet and I will do that for you so you can, you know, say this is wrong, this is right, whatever. And he wouldn't even do that, um, which put me in a very vulnerable position because that is a typical uh, journalistic practice is that you, I, I try to have no surprises with the people I'm writing about. Like, here's what I'm going to say, you know, you have an opportunity to respond. Um, and he wouldn't do that, so I had to really like triangulate everything that is in the book. But again, I'm happy to say that he has not uh, pointed to a single word in this book that is inaccurate. So other than his own inaccuracies, um, the Mets thing. Um, my editor uh, for this book told me beforehand. She's a, she's a very sort of savvy, um, you know, promoter, and she was like, "You have to like go viral on social media about Santos. Like put together a whole." Like list of your in, in, you know interactions with him and like try to go viral. So anyway, I like we we all try to go viral and nothing was working. Like nothing, no one was interested in my tweets about him or the, even the you know the drag queen stuff. So I was like I was dismayed. But then the book is coming out. The day of the book coming out, um, I remembered. I don't even remember how this came up. There's some there was some Mets news. Oh, and I got I got this great piece of information that. Um, that a New York Met, who I will not name, um, said uh, that after this video came out, which I'll, I'm about to describe, after the video came out, um, the Met season was cursed for, for like eternity. <laughs> and, and so the video is Santos on opening day last year um, saying the Let's Go Mets chant, which is, what's the Let's Go Mets chant? Let's go Mets. Yeah, thank you. Everyone knows this, even if you're a Yankees fan. It's like, come on, this is just this is America. Um, Santos goes, um, good luck to the Mets on opening day. Let's go Mets. And it's just like, it's so off. It's so wrong. But he was so bold and confident about it that it's hilarious. Um, anyway, uh, this New York Met, who I will not name, said that that did it for the season. That's why, that's why they lost everything. And so that, that tweet went viral. <laughs> yes. It's a great clip. You can find it on yeah. YouTube. I, I encourage you to check it out. Yeah. It's, it's entertaining, yeah. I always say. Well, thank you all for your great questions. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank Let's you. have a round of applause for Mark. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks thank to the you. library. Yeah, and yeah I'll, I'm happy to sign books and write something funny for you in there if, you, if you'd Absolutely. like. Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Mark's going to make his way back there and uh, encourage you to pick up a book.